Okay, so this is uh, Dr. Stilk. I'm a science faculty here at USM, and we are finally going to go through and record the gap financing module that we tried to get to a couple of times. Um, now, and she had various roadblocks that popped up. So we're going to walk through two examples in this session. The first one we're going to look at is a spreadsheet that'll walk through a pro forma statement for cash flow projections, just to try and get a feel um, on a project for what sort of cash flows we expect it to throw off and, and what sort of value it provides. And then also to try and understand where some of the risk of the project lies. Um, and it'll also give you a template that you can use on, on future projects in the class or outside of the class as well. Um, hopefully that's the goal. Uh, the second project that we'll look at is again sort of a pro forma statement analysis. So it'll be a Word document that we walk through. And with that one, our goal will be not only to get a feel for the cash flows of the projects from an investor's and developer's perspective, but also to see if there's a gap in financing that we need to cover. So um, how much, um, what sort of funds do we expect the project to attract? And what sort of funds will it actually take to buy into the project? And if there's a gap there, we'll look at some options to, to fill in that hole and see if we can make the project happen. So with that, we will jump in. I'm gonna share my screen so that you can see a spreadsheet we're gonna work through. Um, and Dr. Smith, I believe, emailed out copies of these, so you have a blank version of it. And once it's filled in, I'm going to send those along as well, so you can also share those and compare the blank one to the filled-in one and, and see some of the calculations, just in case they don't come through that clear on video. Okay, so um, we start. Yes, go ahead. I was, I was going to ask a question. So one of the things I've, I've encouraged the students to do sometimes is to use a just a, you know, a simplified uh, sources and uses table. Sure. Can you can you sort of uh, talk about this the spreadsheet that you're presenting right now and how that differs from a sources and uses table and why this format would be more preferable for a more sophisticated analysis than a sources and uses table? Oh, fair enough. So, well, at least the way the way I think of it, if you're if you're looking at sources and uses, a lot of times the the goal there is either just kind of get a, like a back of the envelope sketch of of sort of needs for cash and um, the availability cash for a particular project. Um, and, you, and you may be trying to identify a gap there to see if there's something else you need to do. This spreadsheet that we've built for this one, what we're really trying to do with this one is get our arms around how much cash flow we think this project will actually generate. So it's not necessarily sources and uses. In fact, we're not even going to talk all that much about where the cash is coming from. We're just going to look at this is what the project will cost if we want to buy into it. Um, there's, there'll be a little bit of discussion of the financing that's available to, to plug that in, but if there's a hole, we're not even going to look at that at the moment. Okay, um, and terrific. Then, yeah, and then from there, we're just going to figure out, all right, this is what the project costs. This is how much cash we think it's going to throw off. What's left over at the end? Is this thing really going to generate cash flow for us? And so once we figure that out, if it looks like it's a valuable project that we want to invest in, then we probably flip over to maybe sources and uses and start saying, okay, now we want to do this. How can we actually make it happen? And, and how much money will we need to attract to make it happen? Excellent. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay. So we've got some assumptions about this particular project that we'll use to, to build a cash flow statement. The first one here is we're going to assume that the property is purchased in year zero, that is today. It's 60% debt financed, so we're going to borrow 60% of the value. And then the first debt service payment is due at the end of the first year. And that's our first simplifying assumption. We're going to go ahead and look at annual cash flows instead of you know, monthly would probably be more realistic. Um, it ends up just being a whole bunch of cells to look at and, and some um, additional calculation complexity that sort of takes away from the concept of what we're doing. But it's not that difficult to do. If you ever run into a project where you've got to do monthly cash flows, feel free to reach out or, or just look up some YouTube videos. That's it's not a difficult, um, it's not a difficult adjustment. Okay, so we're buying the property today. We're going to finance 60% of it with debt, and the first payment is going to be due one year after we take out the loan. The type of facility is an industrial facility. The rentable square feet, once we acquire it, the, the amount that is available for us to rent out is 150,000 square feet. The lease type is going to be a single tenant, 10 year term, single net. The vacancy rate that we anticipate is 3%. So 
So of that 150,000 square feet that's rentable, we're expecting at any given time about 3%, 3% of it to be vacant and we'll not be collecting rent on. The rent per square foot that we think we can charge is about $8.75. Property taxes associated with this property. Um, we're going to have 50 mills with a 10 year 100% abatement. So there are property taxes due, but they're gonna abate it, which means we're not going to have to pay them over that 10 year period. And we'll see, we're gonna look at this project as a 10 year life. We'll operate it for 10 years and then look, and selling it, look at selling it at the end of that 10 years. So we'll get to dodge these taxes if that actually happens. The operating expenses for the property, and this is on an annual basis, are $170,000 per year. We're gonna also set aside an annual outlay for upgrade of the building, so capital expenditures of $30,000 per year. The purchase price of the property is gonna be $9 million. That's what it's for sale for. And from here, we can actually start doing a little bit of calculation. We got some blank cells here. So the first thing that we're going to plug in is in cell E14, this is the portion of the purchase price borrowed. In the initial assumption, we said we we're gonna borrow 60% of this property. So I'm gonna plug in 0.6 in this cell for 60%. And then it's formatted to come back as a percentage. So it'll appear that way. And with that plugged in, then I can go in and figure out what my loan amount is going to be. How much am I actually gonna borrow? And the way I'm gonna do that is um, I'm actually gonna plug in a formula here. So if I need to change anything, it'll auto update for me. So in cell E13, I'm gonna type equals to tell Excel that I'm about to enter a calculation. And I'm gonna take that 60% that's in cell E14. So I'll click on that guy. And then I'm gonna multiply that by the purchase price of $9 million that's in E12. So we're gonna take 60% of that $9 million. We'll hit enter to do the calculation. And we'll see that if we finance 60% of this project or 60% of that $9 million, we're looking at borrowing $5.4 million to fund this project. Okay, the next calculation we're gonna do is the amount of down payment or our beginning equity that we're gonna put in the project. And if we're borrowing 60% of it, then we're gonna have to put down the other 40% of it. So a couple of different ways we could calculate this one, but I do wanna do a calculation, again, just in case we wanna change anything and it'll auto update for us. I'm gonna do it this way, I'm gonna say equals the purchase price of $9 million, which is in cell E12. And I'm gonna subtract from that the amount of the loan. So I'm gonna say minus cell E13, which is the $5.4 million that we're borrowing. And the difference between those two is gonna be that 40% that we have to put down or $3.6 million. All right, so our interest rate on our loan is gonna be 7%. We're also gonna use that as our discount rate for any present value calculations. The term of that $5.4 million loan we're gonna take out is gonna be 10 years with annual payments. And then our cap rate at year 10 is gonna be 9%. Um, and, and Dr. Smith and, and Tim, y'all may be able to speak better to this, but at least from my understanding from reading the text is typically cap rates will probably look at equitable properties and sort of take an average or just try and make a guess at what it's going to be. This is usually something you kind of build in as an assumption and, and walk into uh, or walk into the project. Exactly, that's my understanding too. You okay. either do some sort of reference uh, forecast or you, um, you know, you, you use some sort of uh, average um, based on the, uh, you know, just based on your, your general expectations for the for the business. Right, right. Maybe depending on the property type or industry or right. whatever it is and kind of look at averages. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. All right. So with those assumptions built, we can actually go through and start projecting some real cash flows now. We're going to start in year zero, which is where we're actually going to purchase the property. Um, and this can be a little bit weird the first couple of times you do it. What we're trying to get in this spreadsheet are the actual cash flows that you are going to experience if you're to invest in this project, right? So yes, you're borrowing $5.4 million, but you're never gonna see any of that cash. The, the bank or the investor is gonna give that to you and turn it over um, to, to purchase the property. So that's not a cash flow you'll actually experience. It'll net out. However, we are going to have to put up the $3.6 million of equity somehow. And for now, we're gonna assume that's us doing it. So in, column C, where we've got year zero, that's today, what's gonna to happen right now if we buy this property, 
in the acquisition and sale row here. So that's in cell C34. I'm going to point it back to, I'm going to say equals, I'm going to point it back to cell E15, which was our down payment amount, right? So that's going to record $3.6 million for us. But because we put it in as a cell reference, if we ever go back and change any of these assumptions, right? Let's say we decide instead of it, the project doesn't look great if we borrow 60%, um, what if we borrow 70%? What if we increase our leverage? So if I simply update that number, the loan amount, the down payment, all that's going to update for me. It'll update in our cash flow projection, right? So that's the, the reason we want to use the cell references um, instead of just typing in the numbers. All right, let me put that guy back. So we've got our right numbers. I'm going to do one other thing to this entry, and this is a pure style choice. This is not something that's either right or wrong. When I'm building cash flow projections, I like to be able to tell at a glance what's a cash inflow and what's a cash outflow. So I like all my cash outflows to show up as um, negatives, however you like to see negatives on a spreadsheet. So in front of E15 here, I'm going to say equals E15. And in front of that, I'm going to type the minus key to tell Excel that that's a negative number and then press enter. And at least the way I have it formatted, it's going to show up in red and with parentheses. So that's kind of a, a flashing red light for me to say, hey, this is a cash outflow. And that can make things a little bit easier. Um, just at a glance to kind of tell what's coming in and what's going out. Because it, it can quickly become just a bunch of black numbers on a sheet and be kind of confusing. All right, so in year zero, that's our only cash flow. That's it, just the, the cash outflow of 3.6 million when we purchased the property. So in the final row here in 35, um, I do want to, I'm going to enter a formula that'll, that'll auto update over the rest of the spreadsheet for me. So I'm going to say equals sum, I'm going to use the sum function and open parentheses. And I'm going to actually highlight the range C32 to C34. And if we look at what will eventually be going on there, what'll, what it'll be is net operating income, which will kind of be our bottom line number for the cash flows project is thrown off, minus whatever debt service we're going to have, and then plus or minus cash flow from an acquisition or sale. In this case, it's going to subtract 3.6 million. And I'll close parentheses. And so it's going to add the values in those three cells together. And of course, in this one, it's just $3.6 million. So what that allows me to do now, though, is if I click on that cell and I get the bottom right-hand corner here, I get my little plus sign. I can click on that and drag it all the way across row 35 out to year 10. And it's going to copy that function for me. So in every single row, it's adding those three cells together. Right now, of course, all the rest of them are zero because we don't have any cash flows in there. But as we go and fill out the rest of the columns, those are going to auto-populate. We don't have to calculate each one um, individually. Okay, so that's it for year zero. Let's go to year one now. Now we're actually going to have some cash inflows. We bought the property, we set it up, and year one is the end of year one. So we've operated for a year. Hopefully we've generated some, some cash inflows, and we're also going to have to make that debt service payment. We're going to have some cash outflows along with operating expenses. And we want to calculate all those and just see where we ended up at at the end of the year, where we think we're going to end up at. So where we will start is with gross rent. Gross rent is what revenue would we expect to generate if we rented out 100% of the rentable area in this project, right? And we'll take care of vacancies later. So in cell D23, what I'm going to do is type equals, and I'm going to multiply the 150,000 square feet of rentable area times the $8.75 of rent per square foot that I think I can charge. Right, so we've got 150,000 square feet that we could rent out. We think we're going to rent out for $8.75 per square foot. So if we multiply those together, we'll get the total revenue we could earn if we rented out 100% of the space. And I'm also going to do one other thing or two other things, depending on how you count it. I'm going to click on this E8 value, and I'm going to press the F4 key in Excel. And when I press F4, you'll see these dollar signs pop up in front of the E and the 8. What that does is make it an absolute reference so that when I go to copy the formula in the cell across my, my spreadsheet, across the row, it's going to make sure it keeps pointing back to this $8.75 value that's in cell E8. 
there and it won't move. If I didn't put those dollar signs in when I copied the formula over, it would move a row every time I copied it over and it would be picking up empty cells, values from empty cells. Okay. So I wanna do that with both of them. I do it in E5 as well. So I'll click on that guy and press F4 to make it an absolute reference. And I can press enter to have it calculate. All right, if we had other tenant um, contributions like the triple net lease or something like that, we could add them in there, any other income that might come off of it. In this particular case, we don't. So I'm gonna leave those two rows blank. And I'm just gonna go to row 26, which is gross income. And I'm gonna again, gonna use the sum function. I'll say equals sum, open parentheses, and add together the three cells above that, D23 through D25. So that way, if we ever do decide to put in, maybe we want to change the lease terms or we're going to do something else with the property, we do want to change those cash flows, the function's already there and the spreadsheet will update for us. So we can say close parentheses and hit enter to have it calculate. Of course, the sum of one number is just that number itself. So no change there. And now what I want to do, that's the end of just the gross revenue section or gross income section. I'm going to highlight those four cells. And then I'm going to again put my cursor down on the bottom right corner of that lowest cell in D26 until it turns into that black cross. I'm going to click it, left click it, and drag it all the way across my spreadsheet so that it copies that formula for me all the way across. All right. Again, the cool benefit of this is if we ever change anything here, like mm, let's say market's looking a little better than we thought, maybe we can charge $10 rent per square foot. So we just update that in our assumptions and it's gonna auto update all the way across the spreadsheet for us. All right, so that's our gross income. Again, that's how much we could, how much revenue we could earn if we're gonna rent out the whole thing, but we don't think we're gonna be able to. It's not a realistic assumption in this case, and usually not in any case. We expect a 3% vacancy rate. So 3% of the property is going to be left vacant. We won't be collecting income on. So what I'm gonna do in this vacancy section in cell D27 is I'm again gonna use a function or a formula at least. I'm gonna say equals my um, gross rent in cell D23. And then I'm gonna multiply that by my 3% vacancy. So 3% of that gross rent I will not be collecting. And so I can think of that as a cash outflow because it's cash I'm not gonna collect. Certainly I wanna subtract it from the gross rent because I don't expect to collect it. So I'm gonna again put a negative sign in front of that just so it shows up as a negative in um, in my spreadsheet, and I have that visual clue that that's what's going on. All right, so we've taken our gross income, we've calculated our vacancy. From there, we can calculate our effective gross rent just by taking the gross income minus the vacancy that we expect. So this one I'm going to use a function for, I'm going to say equals, and call the sum function again. And I'm using the sum function because the gross income I've recorded as a positive, the vacancy I've recorded as a negative, so I can actually add those two together. And what that's going to do is it's going to subtract the vacancy from the gross income for me. If you didn't want to record the vacancy as a negative, you'd actually have to take gross income minus vacancy, which is perfectly fine too. It's kind of a stylistic choice. We'll hit enter and have it calculate for us. All right, and since we use the functions again, we can highlight those two cells Click the bottom right-hand corner and drag that function all the way across our spreadsheet. And it will populate for us just so we don't have to enter it over and over again. And some sharp-eyed folks probably caught the mistake I made there. I did not use an absolute reference in the vacancy. So let's go back and fix that. Um, that was cell D27. So I'm going to click on the formula there and it'll highlight the cells we're using. The one cell, the gross rent, can walk over. Um, because we've got it in the rows, uh, the, the cells above right there, that's perfectly fine, but this 3% cannot move. That one's got to stay as an absolute reference. So I'm going to click on that E7 number, press F4 to make it an absolute reference, and then press enter. 
value in that cell is not going to change, but it will when I copy it all the way over again. There we go. Okay, the next cash flow that we want to worry about is our operating expenses, insurance, maintenance, property taxes, management fees, any of those um, things we've kind of lumped together in this one particular part. Um, well, we already said there's a 10-year tax abatement, so we don't have to worry about that. We have set aside $170,000 for operating expenses, and that's all we're given in the assumption, so we're just going to use that guy. And we'll be paying those for the first time at the end of year one. So in cell D30, I'm going to again use a formula to calculate this. So I'm going to say equals, and I'm going to point back to cell E10, where we've recorded those operating expenses. So that, again, if we ever want to go change that, our, our spreadsheet will auto update and we'll have to go in and change it manually. So I want to do two things to that, that reference to E10 though. First, I'm going to make it an absolute reference by hitting F4 so it doesn't move on me when I copy it. The second thing I'm going to do is put a negative in front of it, just again, so I have that visual clue of it being a cash outflow. All right, so we've got that one. $170,000 cash outflow there. All right, the next thing that we want to take care of is our reserve deposits. deposits uh, reserve deposits are capital expenditures. That's the $30,000 we plan to set aside for any upgrades of the building. I'm going to do the exact same thing here we did in the previous cell. I'm going to say equals and point it back to cell E11 where that $30,000 is. I'm also going to make it an absolute reference by hitting F4. Oops. Hey, I want to make a point here. Um, the, the key word there is upgrade, isn't it? Because when I first read it with, you know, quickly, I thought maintenance. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. Upgrade is the key word. Right, right. This, this, you're actually replenishing or improving an asset instead of a current expense like operating expenses that's already been covered in the line above. Oh. Right, right, yeah. So we're not talking about just maintenance that needs to happen to keep things functioning. Maybe we're upgrading the HVAC system, we're, we're putting better windows in, something like that, yeah. Okay, I, I, I had missed that when I first reviewed this. Okay, good, thank you. Yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> just to, I guess, just to add on to that. And the, the other part of the distinction is that, you know, the, the CapEx funds is that that's just a, that's sort of an, an account that th these funds are being filed away in, right? So it doesn't necessarily mean that you're, you know, going to be spending them at this point in time, whereas right. the operating expenses, those are kind of being planned um, as, as current expenses, right? I mean, they're both current expenses in the sense that they are going to show up, you know, the money's being uh, allocated and moved into, um, you know, you know, there are going to be expenses that uh, occur on the balance sheet, reflected in the balance sheet this year, but the, the CapEx is really just kind of going into a fund pending future decisions about when to actually, you know, acquire whatever that capital equipment is. I would say the 170 is a current liability and the 30 is a long-term liability. Probably so, yeah. I, I would guess that something like this, at least I've never run a commercial property, but in my house, we set aside funds for like, you know, we know we're going to need to replace the reef. We know we're going to need to replace the, the air conditioning system um, eventually, or maybe we want to make some improvements by, you know, rebuilding a deck or, or whatever. You know, we set aside that money, but we might spend it once every five years. Yeah, so right. It kind of accumulates until you actually want to, want to make the investment. Yeah. Okay, but that shows you that a single word makes all the difference in the world there. Right, so, right, right. Absolutely. All right, so let's see. Uh, all right, a capital expenditure. So made an absolute reference. I'm going to put a minus in front of it again just to show. So it's a clue to me that it's a cash outflow. And then at least in terms of the assumptions that we built into this problem, we're ready to go from effective gross rent down to net operating income by subtracting these expenditures from our effective gross rent. Because I put the cash um, outflows in as a negative, I can again use the sum function. So I'll call a sum function, open parentheses, and I'll start with effective gross rent and then highlight all the way down to our CapEx. 
and it's going to add those together. But again, because those cash flows, cash outflows are a negative, it's going to effectively subtract those for me. All right. So our net operating income, the actual income that we think this property is going to flow, uh, throw off to us each year is a little over a million dollars. We're not quite done with cash outflows, though. Um, now, this one isn't necessarily attached to the property. It has to do with our financing decisions, so we're going to look at it separately. Um, and that is our debt service payment, the amount that we're actually going to have to pay to um, start repaying the principal and interest on this loan. All right, with this one, we'll, we'll cheat a little bit. We'll use the Excel functionality and, and have it calculate a payment for us. Um, and if we've got a, an amortizing loan, we're just making annual payments on for 10 years. Um, this guy's going to have a level payment for 10 years, and every, every payment we make is going to have a little bit of principal and interest in it. And Excel knows how to do that. And the function that we can call to have it do that for us is called the payment function. And we call it by typing in PMT and then open parentheses. And then we're going to get a little bit of a, a cheat sheet here for what arguments we need to put in to have it calculate this payment for us. The first one that we need to put in is the rate. That's the interest rate on the loan. For us, we're assuming that's 7%, and that's in cell E16. So I'm going to go up and click cell E16. And I'm going to press F4 to make it an absolute reference before I go to the next one. And I can type in comma to go to the next argument. And we'll see in PER, in per, become bold. That's the next one. That's the number of periods, or in this case, the number of payments we're planning on making on the loan. And that for us is the term of the loan in years because we're making annual payments. And that's in cell E17. So I'll click that guy, type F4 to make it an absolute reference. And then comma to go to the next argument. The next thing we'll see in bold is PV or present value. Um, in this case, the way we're calculating it, present value just means how much are you actually borrowing? What is the loan amount for? And that we've already calculated in cell E13. So I'm going to go up and click that guy. And again, press F4 to make it an absolute reference. And then when we see things in brackets, we've got FV for future value and then type in brackets in the argument. It means those are optional arguments. Um, and we don't need them in this case. So we'll, we'll muddy the waters by, by talking about them too much. So I can just close parentheses. And hit enter, and it'll calculate that payment for us. This is the actual amount um, that we're going to have to pay each year to start paying off that $5.4 million loan. All right, so we got that in. And notice that our actual cash flow there updated for us. Right, it went to $304,286.49 because we had already copied that function over. So that work is done. One thing we do need to do, though, is highlight all of the cells from D29 down to D33. Those cash outflows are going to be the same every single year. So rather than retyping them in or recalculate them from year one out to year 10, I'm just going to highlight them grab the bottom right corner and drag those guys all the way across to year 10. So they will auto-populate. And then we can see our actual cash flow at the end of the year auto-populated as well. All right, there's only one more cash flow to worry about. We're assuming that we're going to purchase this property in year zero, operate it for 10 years, and then at the end of year 10, we're going to sell it. Well, we need to know what we think we can sell it for. And what we're going to use to figure that out is the cap rate that we have assumed at the beginning of the problem, right? And the cap rate is 9%. And cap rate, if we scroll down to the bottom of this spreadsheet, there's a definition there. The cap rate is defined as net operating income over asset value, where asset value is how much the, the property is worth and it's worth what we think we can sell it for, right? So we can think of those two things, asset value and, and what we can sell it for interchangeably. Well, we have the cap rate that was given to us in the problem 9%. We just calculated the net operating income in our spreadsheet. The only thing we're missing is that asset value. So we're going to rearrange this equation and solve for asset value. And then we can have an estimate of what we think we can sell the property for. And if we do that, we rearrange that formula. We end up with net operating income over cap rate is going to give us our asset value. So in this cell D39, I'm going to go ahead and calculate it here, and then we'll plug it back into the spreadsheet. I'm going to say equals 
our net operating income in year 10, because that's when we think we're going to sell it. All right, so net operating income is in row 32. So we're going to grab that guy right here from cell M32. And we're going to divide that by our cap rate, which was in our problem assumption here in cell E18. And press enter. And it's going to calculate for us what, what we estimate we're going to be able to sell the property for. All right, so we think we're going to be able to sell this thing for about $11.9 million at the end of year 10. So in addition to the cash flow, the property is going to throw off at the end of that year. We think we're also going to sell it for the asset value. So in cell M34 here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to type equals and point it back to this asset value that we just calculated of the $11.9 million and press enter so that it plugs that in. In this case, it's a cash inflow because I didn't tell it was a negative. And then notice our cash flow for the end of year 10 updated as well. Instead of 304,000 and change, now it's 12.2 million because we've added to that the $11.9 million we think we're going to sell the property for. Okay, so what we've got now is an estimate of what we think the actual cash flows are going to be to us over the life of this project. We think in year zero, we're gonna have a cash outflow of 3.6 million. Over the next 10 years, it's gonna generate a cash inflow, just operating income for us of $304,000 and change. And then in addition to that, at the end of year 10, we're gonna sell it for just under $12 million for a total cash inflow of 12.2 million um, 10 years from now. Okay, so that's what the cash flows look like. That sounds pretty darn good. But before we just look at those and decide, yeah, that looks good, what we want to do is account for the time value of money. 10 years is a long time, and 7% is a pretty big discount rate. So we want to make sure that once we say, all right, yeah, that's $12 million, but it's at the end of year 10, let's discount those back to time period $0, compare it with a $3.6 million cash outflow we're going to have, and see if this is still, it still looks like a, a good deal, a, a valuable project. So in order to do that, what we're going to do is calculate something called net present value or NPV for short. And you can see the definition of NPV just off to the right here. Net present value is defined as the present value of all cash inflows from the project minus the present value of all cash outflows. Right. So instead of just saying, all right, we've got a three point six million dollar cash outflow and then we've got 10 years worth of cash inflows, let's just add those together and see what happens. What net present value does is account for that time value of money. You're paying 7% interest on this loan. That's a big opportunity cost for you. So we want to account for that interest that you're paying and see if this thing is still a pretty good deal. So Excel actually has an NPV function. We're going to call it by typing equals NPV, creatively enough, for net present value. And then open parentheses. And we'll again get a little bit of a cheat sheet for what to plug in. The first thing it wants is a rate. That's the discount rate that we want to apply to future cash flows. And that's that same 7% that's up here in cell E16. So I'm just going to point back to that. And then I will type in comma. And it goes to the next argument. And that's value 1, value 2, value 3. And it can go on for as long as we need to. These are the actual cash flows that happen. Now, importantly, the net present value function, all it's looking for is future cash flows because it wants to discount them back to time period zero. So we are not going to include any cash up, um, flows that happen today because those don't need to be discounted. They're already in present value terms. So for value one, we're actually going to start and sell D35, which is the cash outflow at the end of year one. And then we're going to drag that. I'm just going to click and hold it and drag it all the way out to cell M35 to get the cash flows from the end of year one to the end of year 10, and then close parentheses. So what we just told Excel is the cash flows from the end of year one to the end of year 10, those are all future cash flows, and those need to be discounted back to present value, back to today's dollars. What we did not include is the cash outflow at time period zero. Right? That's the present value of the cash outflow that we're going to have to experience. So we actually have to subtract that guy manually. So once we put these arguments into NPV, the next thing I'm going to do 
is I want to subtract cash outflows. So I want to subtract this $3.6 million that happens at time period zero, but I've already got it in as a negative. So I'm actually going to type positive plus here to get it to add the negative value in cell C35. Right? We do want to subtract it, but it's already a negative, so we can just enter a plus there. Right? And so that's what I need for NPV. That guy comes out to about $4.6 million. And it's worth pausing right there and thinking about the value that you just calculated. We took the present value of all cash outflows. In this case, that's the $3.6 million we're going to spend today. And we subtracted from that the present value of all the cash inflows we expect to receive over the future, but they've been discounted back to today's dollars. So this $4.6 million, if, when net present value is positive, that means that this project, if we were to take it on and experience all of these cash flows, it is equivalent to putting $4.6 million in your pocket today, because this is expressed in today's dollars. Right, so anytime you have a positive NPV, that means the project generates value over and above your, your opportunity cost, your discount rate, and that looks like an attractive project. It's one that you would want to take on. Anytime you see a net present value that is negative, it means you're you're giving away value with this project, and it just doesn't generate enough cash flow um, to overcome your opportunity cost, the discount rate that's being applied. Okay, so positive NPV of 4.6 million. I don't know about you, an extra 4.6 million sounds pretty good to me. So that's looking like an attractive project. <laughs> I would, the only thing I would struggle with is what exactly I'm going to spend it on. <laughs> right, so another measure of project value is internal rate of return. I should say another commonly used measure. NPV and IRR are by far the two most popular um, measures applied to, to projects just to figure out what the value is. IRR stands for internal rate of return. And this is, it's kind of a rough measure of the return you expect the project to generate. Um, and let's calculate it first. And I'll talk about a little bit about the, the shortcomings that are in there. There's one big one, one real big one. Um, so just like NPV, Excel has an IRR function. So I'll type equals and type in IRR, which calls the IRR function, open parentheses. And this one does not need a discount rate because that's what it's going to calculate. It just needs the cash flows that you expect to experience over the project's life. And for this one, we're going to start at zero and go all the way out to year 10. We don't have to do any manual calculation. So I'm just going to highlight cell C35 to M35, close parentheses, and press enter. And it's going to come up with a value of 18.19%. Okay, that's lovely. That's a number. What does that mean? It means, and, and here comes the big assumption that's baked into internal rate of return, that if we were to invest $3.6 million today and receive the cash inflows that we expect to receive, that we're projecting here over the next 10 years, and importantly, reinvest those cash flows back into this project or another one that also generates 18.19%, then our actual rate of return on this project that we're going to generate is 18.19%. Right, that reinvesting the cash flows at the internal rate of return is a really big assumption. And when we see a, a return of something like 18.19%, that's high. That's really high. And I would guess that you would struggle to find another project to invest in that's going to be 18.19% um, expected return on there. So your effective rate of return might be a little bit lower than that. So it's just sort of a rough measure of, of what to expect. Um, the way to use internal rate of return is to compare it to whatever your opportunity cost is. So this project you think is going to return about 18%. Do you have other opportunities that might offer more or might offer less? Um, do you have some hurdle rate that you're trying to get over? Like you want to return at least you know, 10% or 12%, whatever it is. So you would compare this internal rate of return to whatever your, your opportunity is, whatever you need to compare it to. And as long as the IRR is higher, then it looks like an attractive project and you want to go for it. One interesting thing I had, oh, go ahead. That's yeah, <clears throat> just a quick question about the hurdle rate. Um, so, you know, one thing uh, that's popped up in uh, our readings in the class is we've talked about uh, using stock market, you know, the annual stock market return uh, mm -hmm. as a hurdle rate, um, just as a, a rule of thumb for okay. interpreting the IRR. Is that something that you uh, agree with? 
so the, the big thing to consider with comparing rates is what are the risk of the two opportunities? So if, if the risk, if the volatility of cash flows for these type of um, you know, real estate investments or commercial property investments is similar to the risk that you see in the stock market, then that's a relevant comparison. That makes sense. Um, if, the, if these projects you invest in tend to be a lot more risky, especially if you're only investing in one project and you don't have a, a portfolio of these projects where some will win and some will lose, you may want to consider using a higher hurdle rate to, to get over them. Just the big thing is to make sure that you match risk for risk. Yeah. So it's, you just want to compare it to something that's about as risky as this project is. Um, and the, the thing we're really trying to do here is get an idea of, um, of comparing opportunity cost. Right? So if you have two projects um, that are pretty similar in risk, then you want to take the one with the higher expected return. Right? So that's kind of what IRR is, is going for. Yeah, uh, I, I think that's a great explanation. And I, I think it's, it's, it's useful to, to understand um, that, that distinction that, you know, if you just need something crude or if you're, you know, your true choice is, I'm going to take this money that I would otherwise, um, you know, invest in an office building or something like that. <laughs> I would otherwise just be, you know, dumping it in the stock market, right? Maybe that it's a fair, but otherwise, you you do want to look for um, a similar class of uh, of risk investments, right? Risk based investments, right? right. Okay. Yeah, if the property is significantly riskier like you're really unsure what those cash flows could be they could either be zero or they could be really high and those are the yeah. only two possibilities right, right. And maybe comparing to the stock market isn't the isn't the best comparison because they're very different risks um uh, but yeah so it, it just depends on what the oper other opportunities are and how risky this project is yeah okay something interesting that i had not encountered before until i was reading the text for this class is the idea of partitioning the irr um, and I'll, I'll have a lot of theoretical issues with, with what's going on here, but we're already, we're so far off into, we're projecting cash flows 10 years out. Do we know what those cash flows are going to be? No, right? We have no idea. Um, so we're kind of out on a limb as it is. So I think this is a neat way to start thinking about where is the risk in this project? Because if we think about the cash flows that we're estimating here, they really come from only two sources. There is the net operating income that this guy is generating, and then we'll subtract our debt payment from that to get the actual cash flow. So there's the annual cash flow that we're earning just from owning and operating this facility, right? We're, we're maintaining it and we're renting it out, we're collecting rent and paying um, our expenses. And at the, the end of the year, we expect to generate about $304,000 worth of income while we do that. The other source of income that we generate from this property is the actual sale of it. The $11.9 million we think we can sell it for at the end of the project. So what partitioning the IRR does is it splits those two sources of income out. It says, okay, yeah, we're earning 18.19% on this project, which sounds really great, but where is that return coming from? Is it coming from the, the operating the building, so the annual income that it's generating, or is it coming from the sale of that property 10 years down the road? And if we, we think about why we might be interested in that, well, the annual cash flow we think the property is going to throw off, we can probably predict that with some degree of certainty, right? Unless something catastrophic happens or, or there's just some piece of information we didn't have that was really, um, that really made a difference, we could probably be fairly certain about those, those income values, at least for the, the first few years. The sale of the property 10 years from today, oh man. Who knows? I mean, the facility could get rezoned. There could be some sort of natural disaster. Um, they could, you know, end up turning into a brownfield or or something. Who knows what could happen? Um, maybe it's a well. That's that's enough. We just we don't know what what might happen ten years from now. So we're a lot less certain about that. Um, the sale of the property at the end. So we're gonna we're gonna split the R into two. We're gonna say how much of that return is coming from that operating income that we're more certain about. And how much is coming from that sale 10 years down the road that we're less certain about? And it'll kind of help us get our arms around how risky this project is, right? So in order to partition the RR, we've got to do a couple of things. What we're going to do is we're going to start by calculating 
the sort of the present value of each cash flow that we expect to receive at the end of the year. But it's a weird present value. We're actually going to use the internal rate of return as the discount rate. And the reason we're doing that is so we can split the RR in two. All right, so here's how we're going to do that. In cell C44, I'm going to type in equals and PV to call the present value function and open parentheses. And I'm going to get and get my little cheat sheet of what I need to plug in here. For the rate this time, instead of that 7% discount rate, I'm actually going to call up the IRR that's in cell D42. And I'm going to type F4 to make that an absolute reference. NP, NPR for a number of periods. This is how far in the future this particular cash flow is. I'm going to go up to cell C21 because that tells me where on the timeline the cash flow falls. The first one I'm going to put in is this $3.6 million. That happens today. So it's zero years in the future. So we'll just enter that guy. It's going to be zero. Um, that one I don't need to, I do not want to make an absolute reference because I want it to walk with each of the cash flows. So the cash flow at the end of year one, I want it to pick up the one. Cash flow at the end of year two, I want it to pick up the two and so on. So we'll leave that guy as it is. All right, comma to go to the next value. PMT payment, that would be a reoccurring payment that happens over and over again. I don't want that one. So I'm actually going to type in zero for the payment function. And then comma again to go to the next argument. Future value, this is actually the cash flow that happens at the end of whatever period I'm looking at. And that's where I want to plug in this cash flow value. So for FV, that's where I'm going to go and refer back to cell C35 for this one. And I don't want to make that one an absolute reference because I'm going to copy this function all the way across the 10 years. So it'll calculate the present value of every single cash flow that we projected there. So I can just close parentheses and hit enter. Now with this first one, I have asked it to calculate the present value of $3.6 million that happens right now. Well, there's no discounting that needs to happen. So it's gonna return 3.6 million. I do want to make it a negative. By convention, the, the time value money functions will we'll try and keep track of the direction of cash flows. So when you calculate present value, it flips the sign on you. So I'm gonna put a minus sign back in front of that guy to make it um, come out as a negative. And then once I've got that function in there, what I do is again grab the bottom right hand corner and just drag it all the way out to row M. And it is going to calculate the present value of each one of these cash flows. Remember, each one of these cash flows is happening, for example, this $12.2 million is happening at the end of year 10. We'll in cell M44, where we just run that present value function. This $2.3 million means that expressed in today's dollars, if we use the IRR as a discount rate, that $12.2 million is effectively worth $2.3 million if we were to get, receive it today instead of 10 years from now. Okay, now, this is where things get kind of weird. We're going to see how much of this IRR is coming from those annual cash flows and how much is coming from the actual sale of the property. And all it is is a simple proportion once we've got these present value terms. So in cell D46, where you see the annual CF here, this is the portion of the IRR that's coming from the annual cash flow. I'm going to type in equals. I'm going to call the sum function. And I'm going to have it add together all of the cash inflows that happen from the end of year one to the end of year nine. Those are all those annual cash flows that we're going to receive just from operating the property. And I want to see what portion of those, those represent from our investment. So I've got the sum of all those. I'm going to divide it by the initial investment of 3.6 million. So I'll point it back at cell C44. Um, I don't want this thing to come out as a negative. It doesn't really matter if it does or doesn't, but just for my own taste, I don't want to come out as a negative. So I'm going to put another negative sign in front of that guy to turn it back to positive. And then hit enter. And we're seeing 36.14%. That means of this 18.19% return that we expect this project to generate, about 36% of that, or a little over a third, is coming just from those annual cash flows that the project is generating. 
Now, 36% of that return is coming from the project cash flows. The rest of it has to be coming from the sale of the property. So a couple of different ways we could calculate um, the next portion. We could just do one minus this cell, but to make sure I'm calculating everything correctly, I'm gonna go ahead and do this one manually too. I'm gonna say equals, point it to the cash inflow at the end of year 10, which is mostly the sale of the property, and then divide that by again the 3.6 million that we expect to invest in the project and make that guy a negative just so this number will come out as a positive. Click enter. And we see that 63, almost 64% of the return on this project is actually coming from the sale of the property 10 years out. Now, the reason I manually calculated is not only to see another example of how it's working, but also now I can perform a check just to make sure I did everything right. I can say equals sum, add those two cells together, and they should sum to 100% as long as we've done it right. In this case, it does, so we know our, our calculations are, are probably good to go there. All right, so it just gives a cool measure of, of risk here. About a third of the project's returns coming from those annual in, that annual income, we can be relatively certain about. And almost two thirds of it is coming from the sale at the end, which we can be a little less certain about. Right, so that's a, that's a fairly risky source of, of return, even though it looks pretty good. All right, so I would normally pause here and ask what questions there are, but there's, there's just the two of us. Um, right. <laughs> so we will roll on to the Chadwick example. And I think um, I'm going to stop the screen share here because I think I can only share one application at a time instead of my actual screen. I'll go grab the other one. All right, so this one's gonna be a pretty similar setup, but we're gonna have a little bit different function at the end of this one. We're gonna look at the sources of use, sources and use of the project. It's not gonna be quite as in depth as what we just did. And what we're gonna try and figure out is, are, are there any gaps here? We actually wanna invest in this project. How do we make it happen, All right? Do we, can we attract enough equity and enough debt to invest in the project? And if not, what are some options for, for filling in that gap? All right, so here are our assumptions for this one. Chadwick Development Company wants to acquire and renovate a 25,000 square foot building in Hattiesburg. The acquisition cost is $300,000 and the renovation cost is $50 per square foot. Contingency cost is 10% of construction costs. Chadwick will rent the space at $13 per square foot. The vacancy rate is estimated at 10% and cash expenses will be $5.50 per square foot. USM Credit Union offers to finance 70% of the total project cost at 6% for 20 years. And we're gonna, again, we're gonna assume annual payments just to make our lives a little simpler. All right, so let's start with the sources and uses here. We'll look at first the total project uses, uh, what we're actually gonna have to spend to buy into this project. We're gonna have the acquisition of the property. It says that's gonna be $300,000 to start with. So we'll plug that in. Then there are gonna be renovation costs to get this thing ready to actually start renting out. That's gonna be $50 per square foot. So we'll take that $50 and multiply it by the total square feet in the building, that's 25,000. If we multiply those together, we're gonna get 1,250,000. Absolutely cheating, by the way. I can't do these in my head that quickly. I've got the I've got the answer sitting on my desk. <laughs> um, contingency costs. So we're going to build in contingency costs because we're renovating this thing at fifty dollars per square foot. If you've ever done any kind of construction project, no matter how minor, you know whatever you thought it was going to cost is going to be too little. It's going to be quite a bit more. So we're going to build some of that in just for project delays, equipment we may have to change out, that kind of thing. Um, so contingency costs are going to be ten percent of the construction cost or 10% of that 1.25 million. So we'll take 0 0.1, that's 10% expressed as a decimal and multiply it times the 1.25 million. That one we probably can actually do in our heads, 125,000. 
All right, so we're going to spend 300000 to acquire the property, $1.25 million to renovate it. We're going to set aside $125,000 for contingency costs. So if we add all three of those together, we think this project is going to cost us about $1,675,000 to buy into. So that's our total use of funds just to get into the project. All right, now let's look at our sources of funds. The only one that's listed is uh, the USM Credit Union is going to offer to finance the project at 75% of the total, or sorry, 70% of the total project cost. So we'll take that 0 0.7 and multiply it by our total project cost of 1,675,000. And that will give us a total loan amount of 1,170,000. Not five, two thousand five hundred. So we think we're going to loan for one million one hundred seventy-two thousand five hundred dollars. Well, if that's how much the loan is, we need the one point seven million almost to buy into the property. The rest of it is going to have to be equity from some source, right? So two different ways we can calculate the equity amount. We can take the total project amount and subtract the loan amount, or we could use percentage as well. If seventy percent is coming from a bank loan, then 30% has got to be coming from equity or the rest of the project cost. So the balance there that's going to have to be equity is about 502,500. And if we sum those two guys together, necessarily they're going to come back to our total project cost of 1,675,000. All right, so those guys should match at the end of the day, at least in, in this particular setup. All right, so the next thing we're asked to figure out is what is the annual debt service? So if we take out that $1,172,500 loan, what are our payments going to have to be on that particular loan? Um, and I'm gonna cheat and use Excel again. Um, and I don't know, I'm not sure this, how, how this will show up on screen share. I'm gonna go back to, the spreadsheet and just call the payment function again. So I'm gonna say equals PMT open parentheses. And if you can't see this on the on the recording, I'm gonna I'm gonna copy and paste this back into the Word documents. You'll see exactly what I put into Excel. All right, so for payment, we need the rate. They are lending to us at what was it, six percent? Yeah, six percent for 20 years. The rate is 0.06. Number of periods is 20 for 20 years. Present value, we are borrowing 1,172,500. Close parentheses and enter. An extra one. Oh, I put my interest rate in as 60% instead of 6%. That's a big difference. That's why my payment was so high. There we go. All right, so we think the actual payment time. So here's the function that I put into Excel. And the payment it is spitting back at me is 102,000, but around to the nearest dollar, say $102,224. And so that's how much, how much we'll have to pay per year to repay that loan. All right, now let's do a, a rough developer pro forma just to see what it looks like from that perspective. And this is going to look really similar to what we just did. We're going to start with the gross rent. They think they're going to be able to charge $13, or we think we're going to be able to charge $13 per square foot. And there was $25,000 of rentable space. So we'll take that $13 times 25,000 until our total gross rent, if we could rent out 100% of the facility, would be about 325,000. From that, we want to take out the vacancy because we don't think we'll, we'll rent out 100% of it. The problem said that the vacancy we think is going to be 10%. So that's just an assumption that we're making. 
So we'll multiply that 10% times the 325,000, which that's another one we can probably actually do in our heads. Right? So we're gonna subtract out 32,500 from that to get our effective gross rent. We'll start with our gross rent, subtract out the 32,500 to get an effective gross rent of 292,500. We wanna subtract from that our actual expenses. And if we look back at the problem, it says our expenses, we're anticipating to be $5.50 per square foot. And so once again, we're gonna take the cost of $5.50 per square foot, and we're going to multiply that times the rentable square feet to get a total expected expense of 137,500. And then for net operating income, we're just gonna take our effective gross rent of that 292,500, we'll subtract from that, our expenses to get a total net operating income of $155,000. Next thing we need to take off that, just like we did in the previous problem, is our debt service that we expect to have to pay. We calculated that at $102,224. It's rounded to the nearest dollar. So our actual cash flow that we expect to generate at the end of the day is that $155,000 of net operating income minus the debt service payments. Which will in the end net us an estimated $52,776. So it'll be that sort of bottom line number we came up with on the spreadsheet before. Okay, now we've got some more assumptions to throw in and we can start playing with this a little bit. The credit union is willing to provide financing at 70% which is what we've, we've estimated here, um, only if the project meets the credit union standard for debt coverage ratio of 1.25. Now below that, we've got a definition of debt coverage ratio or DCR. Debt coverage ratio is defined as net operating income or NOI divided by the debt service or the actual payments that you're going to have to make. Right, so to find that DCR, what we're gonna do is take our net operating income that's the 155,000. And we are going to divide that by the debt service payment of 102,224 to get a debt coverage ratio of 1.52. This is a really common risk measure, especially from financial institutions um, and, and lenders of any sort. If you go to, to try and take out a bond, this is something that's gonna be baked into the um, the bond contract as well, something they'll look at. Um, a, a debt coverage ratio of 1.52 means this project is generating 1.52 times the income needed to cover this debt payment. The higher that number is, the safer the bank feels because you're generating more income and you have room to lose some of that income before you have to default on those payments. In this case, that's a little bit higher than what the bank actually requires as a minimum. So when we look at the next question, it says using the credit union's debt coverage ratio of 1.25, what is the maximum loan it will offer? So since we're a little bit higher, we could actually borrow a little bit more and still be within the window that the bank will accept. Right. So what we're going to do is rearrange this formula up here, the debt coverage ratio equals net operating income divided by debt service. We're just going to solve that guy for debt service to rearrange it. So we've got debt service equals net operating income over debt coverage ratio. So our net operating income we think is 155,000. We're gonna divide that by the bank's minimum debt coverage ratio of 1.25 to get the actual debt service or the payment that we could sustain for this project. And if you punch that into a calculator, you'll get something pretty darn close to 
$124,000. Now that $124,000 is the maximum debt payment we could sustain and still maintain the debt coverage ratio that the bank wants to see as a minimum. So we can do something else with this now that's pretty cool. which is um, what the question actually asks us to do. It is, what is the maximum loan that the bank will offer? Well, if we can afford a payment of $124,000, what we can do is go back to Excel or some sort of financial calculator and use the payment function to calculate the actual loan amount that we can borrow. So again, I'm gonna go back to my Excel spreadsheet and I don't know if this will show up, but again, I'll copy and paste the formula that I'm using. I'm going to say equals PV to call up the present value function in Excel. And I'm going to plug in the rate of 6% this time instead of 60%. Number of periods is still 20. I'm going to make 20 payments. The payment here is now what I want to plug in uh, where we just calculated a payment of $124,000. Okay. And we can close parentheses and have it calculate. the payment for us. So it does not like when you put commas and numbers, so take those back out. And I'm getting that we can actually borrow about $1.4 million for this project. Right, so here is the function that I plugged in. And the value that Excel is getting back is 1,422,000. 270 dollars so instead of the was it roughly 1.1 million we were looking at borrowing we can actually borrow more like 1.4 million dollars and still maintain the safety net that the bank wants to see from the project okay next thing we're going to do is restate our pro forma statement using the new loan amount because our debt service payment is going to change what isn't going to change are any of our assumptions about gross rent, vacancy, anything like that. So I'm actually going to scroll back up and copy everything except the debt service payment and just paste it down here in the new pro forma estimate. And the only thing I'm going to change here is the new debt service payment, which we calculated as 124,000, a couple of steps above. And so now our cash flow, net operating income is the same. We've increased the debt service payment. So our estimated cash flow is going to go down a little bit. We've got a net operating income of 155,000. We're going to subtract from that our new debt service payment of 124,000. So now we're looking at cash flow at the end of the day being only 31,000 instead of in the 50,000 range. Okay, now we're gonna use this information to see how much equity we, we can expect this project to attract. Number seven says, assuming Chadwick development requires a 15% cash on cash rate of return, how much equity can be attracted to the project based on the restated pro forma? So on this one where we're looking at cash flow of 31,000. All right, so we've got a definition of cash on cash return. It's the cash flow divided by the equity attracted. So if we resolve this guy for equity, we know the rest of it. We know the cash flow. We know the desired cash on cash return. So we'll just plug it in here. So our cash flow, we think it's going to throw off, is 31,000. We divide that by the 15% cash on cash return that our investors will demand. And we'll see that the maximum equity we can expect this project to attract is about $207,000, right? So that's the amount of cash we'd expect investors to put up and still get their 15% cash on cash return. Right? So now that we have those two pieces of information, we know the maximum loan that we think we can take out. We know the maximum amount of equity we think we can attract. Now we can compare that to the use of funds for the project and see if there are any holes here we need to plug. So for our debt attracted, 
we figured out that the maximum loan we can take out is $1,422,270. We just figured out that the maximum equity we think we can attract based on these assumptions is $206,667. So this is all the cash inflow that's coming in for us. If we plug in the project cost and then subtract these cash inflows, Remember, the project cost was $1,675,000. That's to purchase it, renovate it, set aside the contingency cost, everything else. Well, $1.4 million is coming in as debt, we think. $207,000-ish is coming in as equity. So if we look at the difference between those two, we see that there is a gap of $46,063 left, where it doesn't look like we're going to attract that as debt or equity, so we're gonna to have to try and figure out some solution to plug that hole um, and figure out how to raise that extra 46,000 if we actually want to um, develop this project. All right, now the very last question, this is where um, I sort of step outside my lane. This is not something I have experience with. Uh, what public financing tools might you, might you use to address this gap? Um, I will show, uh, there's a, um, let me stop the share and share a different screen here. Um, I made some notes just from the, the text. So you guys have access to the same source material that I do. In addition to your instructors, you probably know even more about this stuff. In the book that you have, uh, Real Estate Development and Reuse, the 2016 version, they go through in chapter 11, a lot of different sources of financing. And I just sort of made my own notes here. And I have listed the sources of financing from what tends to be least expensive to most expensive, both in terms of, of borrowing costs um, and then also effort to maintain uh, the project and what all is involved to try and make it happen. Um, so rather than just going through this, so y'all can read that, I'll share this document with you as a summary. Um, and this would probably be a pretty good discussion to have uh, with, the, with the folks who, who specialize in this. But I'll save this as a PDF and, and share it with Dr. Smith so we can share it with y'all. Um, and that's, that's what I've got for the, the gap financing material that, um, at least as far as, as this course is concerned. Hey, Dr. Smith, anything else? Uh, you know, I, I don't think so. I think that was a great, uh, kind of a great, uh, run through the uh, sort of the principles of gap financing analysis. Uh, I think the uh, Chadwick uh, assignment was a great uh, kind of you know review of for for them um, of the you know the use of the sources and uses table, but also I think that you know a lot of the principles of that analysis actually carry over uh, and back and you know and vice versa from the from the larger uh, pro forma. Um, and so, uh, I really thought this was, this is really good. I, I personally, I learned a little bit, just like how you, uh, frame certain things. I'm going to sort of borrow some language if that, if that's okay. Of course. It's not mine. I got it from someone else. So you're good. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no copyright. Um, but, uh, so no, I, I think this is good. Um, and you know, so for students who might be watching this, you know, if you have any additional questions, please uh, reach out to Dr. Stelk. Uh, he will be able to, uh, he's happy to assist you. Um, uh, and, you know, I think that, uh, uh, you know, if you're looking for a, a reference text, I know that some of this information is covered a little bit in the IEDC manual. Um, you know, to, to some extent. Um, uh, and, uh, he, you know, if, if you're looking for, you know, just other other material, just reach out to Dr. Selk or myself and we can provide some references for, you know, if you're interested in doing some more uh, you know, intensive study <laughs> or right. uh, self, uh, self-education. So, um, uh, I'll, before we stop, I'll throw this out. Yeah. I noticed this was on the syllabus as a a requirement yes, sir. for the building. I, this yeah. has been sitting on my shelf for over a year. The author sent it to me. It's just a, hey, check this out. And he gives it back. I never read it until I saw it in your syllabus. This is really good. Yeah. Really I, good stuff. And yes. if, if anyone's still watching and you're interested in this stuff, definitely check this book out. Yes, I, I thought it was really good. And uh, I thought in particular, the explanation of 
of the financial analysis, I thought that if you were somebody who's coming to this fresh, this is exactly the kind of language uh, that you would use. It, it, it all makes perfect sense. Um, so that's another great reference if you're still a little bit fuzzy on some of the concepts. So, well, I, Dr. Selk, I think that that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, y'all. Yeah. Again, if anyone's still watching this, I apologize for it taking so long. It's been a it's been a wild ride trying to get this one done. I've just finished my calls. <laughs> I'll catch up with the recording. Thank you. All right. All right. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you again. Okay. Bye. Okay. Bye. Okay. See y'all. Bye. Bye.